It's a uh, privilege of mine to introduce Sir Michael Marmot, who's unquestionably one of the world's leading experts in the socioeconomic gradients in health and the social determinants of those uh, inequities. He's also one of the most compelling and effective advocates for changing the circumstances that lead to those inequities. I first became uh, familiar with Sir Marmot's uh, research uh, when I learned of some of his publications about Japanese Americans and cardiovascular disease. It had been observed that Japanese Americans had cardiovascular disease rates that were lower than Japanese in Japan and those in Hawaii had uh, intermediate rates. And he did some fascinating landmark studies that demonstrated the link between acculturation and cardiovascular disease rates. He went on to do many more extremely important landmark studies. One of the most uh, well-known is the Whitehall study. There have been almost innumerable important findings from that, but one of the ways it changed our thinking was the demonstration that inequities in health were not just between deprived and poor individuals and affluent individuals, but Whitehall showed that even within uh, British civil servant employed individuals, there were important gradients. Uh, Sir Michael has numerous leadership and honorific titles. He leads the English Longitudinal Study on Aging. He chairs the UK Department of Health Scientific Reference Group on uh, Tackling Health Inequities. He's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and an honorary fellow of the British Academy. In 2000, he was knighted by the Queen for services to epidemiology and understanding health inequities. Sir Michael is Vice President of the Academia Europea and is a member of the Institute of Medicine. He was Chair of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health set up by the WHO. He's won the Balzan Prize for Epidemiology, has given the Havarian Oration in 2006, and won the William B. Graham Prize for Health Services Research. At the request of the British government, he conducted a review of health inequities, which published its report, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, in February 2010. If you travel around the world, people don't use that title. They refer to it as the Marmot Report. He's now been invited by the regional director of WHO to conduct a European review of health inequities. One of the more fascinating developments, I think, in Michael's career is that he currently is president of the British Medical Association. I think it's fascinating because someone who has spent a lot of his career challenging conventional ideas about the determinants of health is now one of them. He's been embraced by the government, by professional societies, and by people throughout the world who now recognize the importance of what he's done and are accepting his leadership to change those circumstances. Please join me in welcoming Sir Michael Marmot, who will present about Fair Society, Healthy Lives. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I won't detain you for long by telling you how much I'm sad to miss the royal wedding. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's actually a double pleasure to be here. <laughs> As Paul said, you've heard dazzling science this morning. What I've been trying to do in the last little while is use the best scientific evidence we can gather, not just to understand the world, but to change it. One of the arguments I've been making, and as I go along, I'll show you <coughs> the evidence on social determinants of health, is that health is a good measure of how we're doing as a society. There's a lot of interest now in well-being. I would say health is a better measure of well-being than well-being is. And particularly the distribution of health across society. Health inequities, I, your successor as director of NIH told me that you never used the term inequality but the rather bland term disparities. Uh, we use a rather more muscular uh, inequalities uh, to say what we're talking about. But as Paul said, there's the issue of the social gradient. Let me show you, because uh, Whitehall changed my life, uh, it's not many people can say that about the British Civil Service. Um, and in case you're doubtful that insights from studying British civil servants could lead to my involvement in global health, I'll try and convince you of that 
Uh, if you're not convinced by the time I finish, then you can send me back to watch the royal wedding. <laughs> um, so these are data from the first Whitehall study. And men, in the second Whitehall study, we studied women as well as men, but men are classified by their employment grade. Now these are people permanently employed in the British civil service. We exclude the richest people in society and we exclude the poorest people in society. And what you see, the drama of this, is not just the higher mortality in the people at the bottom compared with the top, but it's the gradient. People near the top have higher mortality than those at the top. In the Marmot Review, in the review of inequalities that we did in England, we plotted life expectancy by neighbourhood income deprivation. So each of these dots represents a small area of England classified by level of income. And the top graph is life expectancy. What you can see is people near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. Those in the middle have shorter life expectancy than those near the top. And it goes all the way down. In fact, if you're concerned with inequalities in health, you should not be concerned only with the poor health of the poor, important as that is. And the implications are really quite profound, both for understanding and for policy. If the problem is the poor health of the poor, then we should study the poor. And it's not totally fanciful to understand why living in absolute poverty could lead to poor health. But here we've got the social gradient right across the whole of society. And the implications are not just to reduce poverty, but to change society. The bottom graph is disability-free life expectancy. You can see a steeper gradient for life expectancy, the gap on average between the 95th centile and the 5th centile was seven years. For disability-free life expectancy, it's 17 years. Now, it's been put to me that nobody will be concerned about health inequalities unless we can convince governments that it makes economic sense to take action. My argument has been that we should take action for moral reasons. Avoidable health inequalities, avoidable health inequalities are wrong. Putting them right is a matter of social justice. Now suppose I tried to make the economic case. Look at the difference between life expectancy and disability free life expectancy. At the top, people spend about 12 years of their lives with disability. At the bottom, 20 years. I've got a really cost effective measure for reducing that hand out free cigarettes to the poor. You don't look very excited by that. <laughs> of course you're not excited by that. It's corrupt. It's morally wrong. We don't do things just because they're efficient and cost effective. We do what's right. And you know that. That's why you're not interested in handing out free cigarettes to the poor, even though it's cost effective and efficient because it's the wrong thing to do. Now suppose I were to try and take an economic argument. This green line represents government policy. The previous government in Britain had a policy of advancing working age to 68 by 2046. The current coalition government wants to do that more quickly. Were retirement age today at 68, three quarters of the population do not have disability free life expectancy as long as 68. Government policy will run into the buffers if we don't take action on the social gradient, the whole of society 
in disability free life expectancy. And you see it in the US. I can't resist showing you this. We did a comparison from the English Longitudinal Study of Aging and the Health and Retirement Study, looking at seven common diseases. I'll show you three here. The social gradient by income, both in England and the US. And for these seven common diseases, Americans were sicker than the English. A journalist in England said he now uses this as a case study of how good news gets little reported and bad news gets greatly reported. This ran and ran in the US that the Americans had lost the health wars to the British, uh, but it got a brief mention in the British press. But in both cases, you see, particularly for diabetes and heart disease, the social gradient. <coughs> It's been put to me by colleagues working in low-income countries that the social gradient is an effete concern of rich countries. He said, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, we're concerned with the poorest of the poor. And as I'll show you in a moment, that's not an adequate description of what's going on. It relates in part to the question of what's more important, absolute or relative deprivation. Amartya Sen, Nobel laureate in economics, said that relative deprivation in the space of incomes, in the income dimension, can yield absolute deprivation in the space of capabilities. Translating that into English prose, what it's saying is it's not just what you have, but what you can do with what you have. And that's key both to the understanding of the social gradient in health and the policy implications. When we look beyond the rich countries, we see this sort of phenomenon. Life expectancy for men in Sierra Leone is under 40. In Iceland, it's 80. For women, Life expectancy in Zimbabwe and Afghanistan is 42. In Japan, it's 86. And there's no good biological reason why we should be looking at a spread in life expectancy of more than 40 years. When we published the report of the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, I highlighted the Scottish city of Glasgow. In the poorest part of Glasgow, life expectancy for men is 54, and in the richest part, it's 82. A 28-year difference in life expectancy in one Scottish city. Life expectancy for men in the poorest part of Glasgow is eight years shorter than the average in India. In India, three quarters of the population live on $2 a day or less. No one in Glasgow lives on $2 a day or less. In Glasgow, they don't die of malaria. They don't die of communicable diseases. You turn on the tap, the faucet, the water's safe to drink. The food safe, well, doesn't kill you in the short term. Uh, <laughs> they die of heart disease and cancer and violent deaths and other alcohol-associated deaths. And so powerful are the social determinants of health that life expectancy for the poorest men in Glasgow is eight years shorter than the average in India. And you have similar differences in the United States. And the gradient is not an effete concern of people working in rich countries. When that was put to me, I said to this colleague working in Uganda, look at under five mortality for the middle wealth quintile at 160 per thousand live births. If you had a population with an under five mortality of 160 per thousand live births, wouldn't you think that was worth taking action? That's the middle quintile in Uganda, which is higher than the bottom quintile in India. And you see in country after country, it's a social gradient. We should be trying 
to get everybody up to the level of the best. And indeed, we should be trying to get the best to a better level. And as I said at the beginning, the social gradient implies that we have to take action across the whole of society. And it was that in mind that the then Director General of WHO, J.W. Lee, set up the Commission on Social Determinants of Health and invited me to chair it. We launched the Commission in Santiago de Chile in 2005. President Lagos of Chile hosted the launch and he then became a member of the Commission, uh, J.W. Lee. J.W. Lee said the goal's not an academic exercise. Actually, I think academic exercises are good things, having spent my life in a university, but he said it's not an academic exercise, but to marshal scientific evidence as a lever for policy change. We published our report in 2008 and called it Closing the Gap in a Generation. Closing the gap in a generation. I've just shown you that there's larger than 40 year gap in life expectancy across the world. And we called our report Closing the Gap in a Generation. It was a statement that we have the means. It was a statement that we have the knowledge to close the gap in a generation. The question is, do we have the political will to do it? And doing it, as I've said, is a matter of social justice. And we put at the center of what we were trying to achieve empowerment of individuals, of communities, indeed of whole countries. And we saw empowerment as having a material dimension, having enough money to live on, psychosocial, having control over your life, not suffering from the sort of chronic stress that Elizabeth Blackburn was just showing us, and political, having voice. We had three principles of action. The conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. The structural drivers of those conditions at global, national, and local level. And the importance of monitoring, training, and research. And in the conditions of daily life, we had recommendations on each of these. And in the structural drivers, health equity in all policies, good global governance, gender equity, political empowerment, market responsibility, and fair financing. I was in Norway presenting our report, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Norway said, I am a health minister, every minister, is a health minister. And I would say that every sector is a health sector. What happens in education and environment and in finance all affect health. This is not, as president of the BMA, the doctors trying to take over, as usual. By the way, nobody was more surprised than I when I got a phone call saying, would you like to be president of the British Medical Association? I said, you know who you're talking to. This is Michael Marmot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you know what I do? They said, yeah, we know you, what you do. I said, I'm not going to stop talking about health inequalities just because I'm president of the British Medical Association. They said, no, that would be fine. Uh, we'd like you not to get too political. Um, we'd expect the president to be above the fray. Uh, I'll say a word about that in a moment. Uh, but, but nevertheless, although I think what happens in the health sector is important, what happens outside the health sector is of vital importance. And we said in the final report of the Commission that health inequity results from a toxic combination of poor social policies and programs, unfair economic arrangements, and bad politics. I thought we shouldn't come on too strong. Just to, uh, pull our punches a little bit. The question is, what would governments make of this robust language? I never thought I would get to the stage in my life where I thought what happened at a World Health Assembly was important. 
but there we are, it happens. And at the May 2009 World Health Assembly in Geneva, 39 government representatives spoke glowingly about the Commission's report, accepted the general recommendations. One of the recommendations we made was that there should be a global summit on health inequalities and, and social determinants of health where all governments be asked to report what they've been doing. Brazil came forward and said, we'll host it, and it, there will be a Rio summit in October this year. And I was thinking, good heavens, one Sunday night I wrote down this recommendation, a global, and now it's happening. They're hoping to have 120 governments represented in Rio uh, in October this year. The current Director General, Margaret Chan, either she or her speechwriter took the view that uh, public health can be grateful for backing from the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. One of the issues with the Global Commission is that we were making recommendations for the whole world. Sub-Saharan Africa and Glasgow are rather different. Latin America and North America. And the question is how to take this forward. Well, we tried to make a virtue of necessity, and we said it was important for governments to take this on and to see how they could translate the findings into their country context. Brazil set up its own Commission on Social Determinants of Health. There's President Lula holding the report of the Brazilian Commission. There's a tinge of sadness, I would say, but that's because Brazil didn't win the World Cup. Um, <laughs> I presented a copy of our report to the Indian Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh. Dr. Singh asked, what would you like me to do? I thought, he's the Prime Minister of 1.1 billion people, and he's asking me what he should do. I said, with respect, that life expectancy in India for women had improved by 13 years in only 30 years. It was now 63. It was 23 years shorter than in Japan. And there was no reason why it shouldn't be the same as in Japan. Were he minded to take the recommendations of the commission and set up a process to see how it could be applied in India, I ventured to suggest that there would be benefit all round. Sri Lanka. President uh, accepted the report, then said about killing Tamils, which wasn't quite what we had in mind, but uh, <laughs> they've expressed some enthusiasm. Uh, the new president, Costa Rica, said that she would make it a priority for her presidency. So there's been some acceptance from different governments around the world that they really want to do this. And it started, I have to say, with Whitehall, with the social gradient in British civil servants. And the British government invited me to conduct a review of health inequalities in England. And we published our report, and I called it Fair Society, Healthy Lives. And this gets to the uh, non-political nature of my position as president of the BMA. I was making a speech to the World Medical Association, and I said I was rather regretful that we'd used the title Fair Society, Healthy Lives because the coalition government in Britain labels everything they do as fair. They raise value-added tax, which is regressive, and they call it fair. They cut benefits to the poor, and they call it fair. They let the bankers get away with blue murder, and they call it fair. I said it's a grotesque parody of fairness. Next week, headlines in the British Medical Journal news section, President of the BMA labels government policy as grotesque parody of fairness. The Chairman of Council said ruefully, I guess you could call that apolitical. Um, <laughs> so I want to tell you a little bit about the English Review. And I venture to suggest that much of what we did and concluded and recommended in England would indeed have resonance in the United States. Let me start with the fact that context matters. 
This is a graph showing the share of total household income firstly enjoyed by the top 20% of earners. So 1977, the top 20% had about 36% of total household income. We then climbed this cl steep cliff. So it went up to about 42, 43%. That was Margaret Thatcher was elected prime minister. Thatcher, Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, didn't make any difference. Once we got to the top of that cliff, the share of total household income enjoyed by the top 20% stayed up there. This is the share of total household income for the bottom 20%. Started off at about 9% and went down to around 6% and stayed there. Now that's bad enough. The dotted line, is post-tax. It doesn't make any difference at all. I thought, what do I know? I'm a doctor. I don't know clever stuff like economics. I thought we had a progressive taxation system. We don't. We have a proportionate taxation system. I think if you put fairness at the heart of all decision-making, you wouldn't do that. You certainly wouldn't do that in the United States. Um, <laughs> this is the household income level at 2005 inflation adjusted dollars, the 95th centile, and down here we have the 10th, the 20th, the 50th centile. Essentially, had no change in income, the median. But this is what happened up at the 90th and the 95th centile. If you break that down and go for a longer period of time, this is the top 1%. Something interesting happened in 1929. I can't quite remember what it was. Um, but in 1929, the top 1% had about 24% of total household income. It then went down to about 8%. Look what happened in 2007. What interesting thing happened after 2007 when the top 1% went up to about 23% of total household income. Who benefited from that? Who benefited from that? Is that putting fairness at the heart of all decision making? And it has an impact on the next generation. This shows international comparisons of income mobility. The problem with large income inequality is the larger the gap between the rungs of the ladder, the more difficult it is to climb that ladder. So what this graph shows is the comparison of income of adult children with their parents. If you scored one, there's complete correspondence with the income of offspring and the income of parents. If you score zero, there's no relation. There's the US and there's the UK. You may think in the land of the royal wedding that we've got more crystallized social structures than you do. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, the royal wedding's only been cooking for about seven years. So you've been planning this event for 200 years in, in Yale. Um, you have less income mobility than any other rich country. Italy, France, Australia, Norway, Sweden, Germany, Canada, Finland, and Denmark. So it's having big impact on the next generation. The myth is, of course, that any mother's son can be president. The fact is, the reality is, that with big income inequalities, there's much less social mobility. Who your parents are matters much more in the United States than it does in Italy, France, Australia, Norway, Sweden, etc. 
In the English Review, we had six levels of recommendations based on the best science we could find. And I'll go through some of them just briefly. The first was give every child the best start in life. These data come from the 1970 British birth cohort study. And they look at cognitive development at age 22 months followed to 10 years of age. And these are relative scores. Look first at the children who at 22 months ranked in the 10th centile. If they grew up in families of low socioeconomic status, they remain low. There's some regression to the mean, but that need not detain us. If they grew up in families of high socioeconomic status, they catch up. Look at the children who are in the 90th centile at 22 months. If they grew up in families of high socioeconomic status, they remain high. Families of low socioeconomic status, they decline. So if you're poor and clever, it doesn't help you much. By the time you're 10, it wouldn't have mattered much. If you're rich and dumb, you still get up there. <laughs> this is now known by uh, political commentators in Britain as that graph. <laughs> Assume for the moment that all the differences at 22 months were biologically determined. Genes, birth trauma, and that the differences associated with family of rearing were social. The social trumps the biological. In fact, not all the differences at 22 months are biological. The quality of rearing in the first 22 months of life makes a huge difference. But it shows how profound early life can be. Now, why am I showing you this? We're talking about health. Because early child development determines what happens when children get into the school system. That in turn determines what happens in terms of employment and income and where you live. And that in turn influence, it may influence telomere length uh, and telomerase <laughs> activity. Uh, and it certainly influences health. Gaps in school readiness at age three and five it's a gradient, school readiness at three by income quintiles. Are you getting the message about the gradient? It's not just about the very poorest. And conduct problems goes the other way. Can we do anything about this? Data from Canada suggest half the deficit in readiness for school associated with low income can be reversed by reading to children every day. This is the social gradient in reading to children every day. It was put to me that we were reporting into an adverse economic climate. Here's a really expensive intervention. Read to your children daily. I was presenting the, these data to one region in England with a mix of chief executives from local government and chief executives from primary care trusts. And one chief executive from local government leapt to her feet and said, we should implement this this afternoon. What are we waiting for? Regular bedtimes at age three is one measure of consistency of parenting. And mother suffered postnatal depression with catastrophic effects on the development of the children. And it follows the social gradient the other way. Skip over education. Create fair employment and good work for all. This is the percent of 16 to 18 year olds not in education, training and employment, which is absolutely vital. In this economic downturn, the effect of unemployment is selectively impacted on younger people. 16 to 17 year olds, 37.7% unemployed. At the British Medical Association, I debated with our senior health minister, the Se Secretary of State for Health, and I said to him, this is a public health measure. 
active labour market policies are vital for the public health. As we were doing the English review, we formed, formed partnerships with various parts of England, one of which was in Liverpool, a deprived part of the Northwest. And they said to us in the recession of the 1980s, young people leaving school who didn't get into work never got into work and spent a lifetime in unemployment. And now we're looking at second generation children facing the same future. And when we look at quality of work in Whitehall too, we've been looking, for example, at job control, uh, high grade, low grade, the higher the grade, the higher the level of control in the job. And we've shown, I won't go into the data now, that high control is associated with lower risk of coronary heart disease, lower risk of mental illness, lower risk of absence from work. This was a really radical recommendation. In a rich society, ensure that everybody has the minimum, the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. We said you can calculate how much you need to have a healthy life. It's more than food, clothes, and shelter, but sufficient resources to, to participate in society and maintain human dignity. We said that if a pensioner, an old age pensioner, does not have sufficient money to buy presents for her grandchildren, she doesn't have the minimum income for necess necessary for a healthy life. She can't live a life of dignity. And we said you can do that calculation. The minimum wage and for people on benefits should be set with regard to the minimum necessary for a healthy life. Create and develop healthy and sustainable places and communities. Let me show you just one example of some of the research on this. People are classified here in two ways, by income group and by exposure to green space and looking at deaths from circulatory disease. So look first at the group that had the least exposure to green space. The relative mortality from circulatory disease in each group is taken as one. The second income group had a relative mortality of about 1.3, the third income group 1.7, and the bottom income group about 2.2. Now look at the group with the middle level of exposure to green space. Again, you see the social gradient, but it's shallower. Now look at the group with the most access to green space and the gradient is shallower still. Now, of course, higher income people have more access to green space, but give the population more access to green space and you reduce the social gradient in death from coronary heart disease. We put in our report figures that the amount of money that had been spent on road improvement over a four year period, had it been spent differently could have led to 1,000 new urban parks, two in every local area, with beneficial effects on physical and mental illness. And strengthen the role and impact of ill health prevention. Currently, only 4% of the National Health Service funding is spent on prevention. We said in our report that should go up to 7%. I said to my colleagues afterwards, where did we get 7% from? How the hell did we get to 7%? Nobody could remember where we got to, but it's, I guess it sounds more scientific than doubling it, you know, so we said 7%. Anyway, it should be more than it is. Um, and there should be partnership working. I've been thinking a little bit about the social justice question. The most prominent philosopher from that other New England University, uh, John Rawls, um, who's, uh, no one can think about social justice without thinking of Rawls justice as fairness. And Rawls difference principle says that anything that improves the lot of the worst off is fairer than the alternate situation. So, I've stylized this social position 
mortality rate, high social position low, <coughs> there's the social gradient. Now imagine we improved things. And so the mortality went down for all groups, but it went down more for the top groups. In fact, the higher you were to begin with, the greater benefit you got. In fact, that's what's happened in the UK and the United States over time. Health has got better for everybody, but the gradients got steeper. Now, under a Rawlsian formulation, the blue is fairer than the red because things got better for the worst off. Now, I've argued with economists. Scratch an economist, you find a utilitarian. They say all economists would agree that the blue's better than the red because everybody's better off. I guess that's true. But to call it fairer when we've got steeper inequalities seems to me perverse. It's better if everybody's better off. And that suggests to me that we have to have two major goals. One is to improve health for everybody. The blue is an advance on the red. But the second major goal is to make it fairer, to reduce inequalities in health. So we've made progress on the one, but not on the other. And we've got to do both. And health inequalities are not inevitable or immutable. Look at two regions of England, the northeast and the southwest, by socioeconomic classification. This is mortality for the top group, the doctors and the lawyers, and then going down the social gradient. The lower you are in the social gradient, the more it matters where you live. The gradient is steeper in the northeast than it is in the southwest. If we can have that much difference in the gradient at one point in one country, then surely we ought to be trying to get the gradient in the northeast to represent that in the southwest. It ought, in principle, to be possible. Amartya Sen, who I've quoted, consistent with what I've been saying about empowerment, says the success of an economy and of a society cannot be separated from the lives that the members of the society are able to lead. We not only value living well and satisfactorily, but also appreciate having control over our lives. Let me finish with Glasgow, where I started. Glasgow, Liverpool, and Manchester are all, in a sense, post-industrial cities. If you want to understand what I mean, go and visit Cleveland, and you get the picture. These are all post-industrial cities, hollowed out. And they have rather similar levels of income inequality. But Glasgow has higher mortality than Liverpool and Manchester. Look at the causes of death that show the biggest relative excess in Glasgow compared to Liverpool and Manchester. Drug-related poisoning, alcohol-related deaths, suicide, and external causes. And then lung cancer, which is behavioral. It's smoking. But these four, they are all chronic stress. They're all psychosocial. A major element of the excess risk of premature death seen in Scotland is psychosocially determined. And Harry Burns, the chief medical officer for Scotland, says, points to study evidence of low sense of control, self-efficacy, self and self-esteem in populations in these areas. Colleagues, at a university like this one, with a distinguished tradition, and a medical school, as I've heard, I think, three times in the last 12 hours with the highest NIH income per faculty member of any university in the United States. Uh, so with a deservedly proud tradition, we have to think about how we can use science in the best interest of promoting the health of populations and reducing inequalities in health. And I come back to why we call the English Review Fair Society Healthy Lives. 
put fairness at the heart of all decision making and health will improve and health inequalities will diminish. I think what we're trying to achieve is conditions in which individuals and communities have control over their lives and participate fully in society.